It says we're live, so I'm going to trust that we're live. Let me shoot on out to my group page or my business page and see if we're out there already. And I think we are live. Let me move this over. And there we go. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Heather Morris. I'm with Bold Beyond Belief. And this is Michelle Ryan. And I am going to read a little uh, bio about her, which is quite an impressive one. Michelle's a unique blend of yin and yang. She's both a public defender and a yoga instructor. She founded Balanced Professional eight years ago to help overachieving entrepreneurs to have it all a vibrant personal life and a successful career. She's the creator of the business code, excuse me, the business freedom code and the thrive formula. Michelle has trained hundreds of lawyers and judges throughout the state on how to thrive while working in a highly stressful field. <laughs> Welcome Miss Michelle. How are you this morning? I am good. Good. Actually enjoying the fact that uh, we have dry weather here in Portland. So yay for that. It's December. Yeah. My um, my husband and my son are out uh, sledding or something. I don't know what they went up to um, uh, Mount Hood today. And so they are out there sledding somewhere, which is not my cup of tea, but it's lovely to look at. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nice part about being in Portland. We can go to the snow. Yes. Yeah. You can go to the snow for a day or to the beach for a day and... So it's lovely out today. How was your holiday? It was good. A little uh, little fun surprise. We were looking to rescue another dog. We'd lost our dog last month. Mm -hmm. It was over, she was 14 and a half. So she lived a very long, healthy life till the very end. But the house felt very, very empty when it was Thanksgiving without her. And so we're like, I don't know if we can make it through COVID without another dog in the house. Mm -hmm. For the first time since 1997, we haven't had a dog. So we started looking, and it's a very interesting process right now to get a dog and adopt it. It's very different than normal. And we ended up uh, rescuing a dog from Texas. And he, we were, we were told we missed the last transport of December. And then a week later, a week before Christmas, we were told he's on, we're doing an, ex an extra one this month. So we got our new dog for Christmas and he is so sweet and so good. And it's really nice to have a furry friend in the house again. Of course. I think I saw him. He made an appearance on another call we were on yesterday. Was that the, the new dog, right? Yes. Yes. I actually told him that he maybe shouldn't be in here because he has a tendency to howl from time to time. <laughs> he's a part <laughs> loud part hound and he's still getting used to all the city noises because he's from the country in Texas. Yeah, that's so funny. We got a rescue dog from Texas, too, that they brought her up uh, on, a, on a little van. So I wonder if it's the same. You know, there's lots of dogs that are um, in the streets in Texas. So I think that that's for a fairly common thing. And my understanding is right now, shelters are empty because everyone's adopting dogs, which is awesome. I love that. Did you guys encounter that, too? Yeah, we did. We were rather particular about what kind of dog we wanted because the stage of our lives and what we're not up for training a puppy all over again and dealing with all of that. No way. Love them for their cute little kisses, but don't want to deal with all their messes in the house. So we wanted an adult dog and we wanted someone who's being good with kids because my next door neighbors have little kids and also good with other dogs because we live in town. We literally live in down and uh, in our Southeast, I guess I'll call it. So there are dog parks. We want to be able to get him out and about and not be afraid of other dogs. So to find a dog who matched all those things was much harder than it normally is. We actually put our application in for one dog. It was down in Salem, which is an hour away. And we weren't the first ones in, so we didn't get that dog. And we were told to keep on a plot. You're, uh, you've been pretty cleared. You can do anything. Like just choose another dog. I'm like, well, I don't know that I want to go an hour away always. I they didn't understand what my goals were. <laughs> I had very clear goals, which is why we ended up with a dog from Texas. But yeah, the shelters, it's been interesting. I have a lot of friends who are involved with dog rescue. I actually used to volunteer at the Humane Society here for five years training dogs. So a lot of my good friends are from that time. And my friend Julie posts photos almost every day when she goes and walks the dogs there. And there are a bunch of new dogs there I just saw. Some really oh, cute good ones. Yeah. But I think they go really fast. Yeah. 
app, which is awesome. I love that. I yes. Love that. Get all the dogs at home for Christmas. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> we are going to dive right into some questions. So tell us a little bit about the journey that brought your company to what it is today. Like, what was your inspiration for that company? Hmm. I'm going to try and go with the medium version because the short version doesn't make as much sense if you don't know a little bit background. So I worked for three years as a public defender, which is a very highly stressful job. And while I was there, randomly, I tripped on loose carpet at work and I ended up with a massive head injury. And I was out for six weeks with post-concussion syndrome, which meant I couldn't compare prices at the grocery store, read. I really freaked out mentally for a little while there, like what's gonna happen? My disability insurance kicked in and financially it was fine, just it was scary. And finally I just gave into it. Luckily I've been doing yoga. So I just, I'm like, okay, I can control my breath. I can control what I'm doing. And my thoughts need to calm down too. So I just let go of what's gonna happen in the future, focused on healing and I got well. But when I came back to work as a public defender after being out for six weeks, it wasn't really, my thing, I didn't want to give all of my time and all of my energy to work, miss my friend's birthday parties, miss everything. It seemed like not being able to go home as often as I'd like to. So I started my exit plan and I took some time thinking about it and I actually left the public defender's office. I still do public defense, but I do it from my office here at home and I get to do it my way. And I started realizing that my colleagues and friends were still stuck in that cycle where they just were burning themselves out over and over again. Or what my grandfather used to call, my grandparents were entrepreneurs. He called it pigeon fever because we were the last operating live pigeon trap shooting in the country down in Kentucky, where my family's from. Uh -huh. And so my grandfather would have four to six shoots a year that would last five days. And he would work himself so hard getting ready for it, going through the gun shoot. And then he would totally burn out and he would collapse practically. And he would be sick for a week or two. Coincidentally, my dad married a woman who does the same thing. My mom does that too. So I watched this, my elders, and I'm like, I don't want to do it that way. And I could see that that was going to be a cycle as a public defender. I'm like, there's got to be a better way because I'm rather uh, stubborn. I like to make things work and I want things to work the way I think they should work unless it's absolutely impossible. So I started figuring out how is it working for me? Because once I left that office, I started having a whole bunch more time. I could do things with my friends. I could go to the Pilates classes and the yoga classes and whatever I wanted to do. And I got work done too. And I was just as successful, if not more successful with my work because I had more time and downtime so that I was refreshed every day rather than exhausted at 8 a.m. And so I started thinking about, I worked with a coach for a little bit when there was a little hiccup with some personal family stuff. And she actually was the one who put the idea in my mind. She's like, you're so good at doing this and you've been mentoring other lawyers for free for how many years? And I was like, that's just part of what we do. She's like, you could actually get paid and help more people. So she put the seed in my head. I actually went through a program about coaching and there was a lot about it that resonated, but because I'm stubborn, because I am who I am, I like everything to be about me and what works for me. And so it's not a cookie cutter whatsoever. It's me being a total research geek, applying those things to my life, seeing what works. And then I started talking to people about it. And Heather, you and I talked a little bit about the word coach before we got on. And I tested the waters by mentioning it to some friends or people I didn't even know at parties. And the word coach did not resonate whatsoever with most of the people I talked to, which really disappointed me. But <laughs> again, I'm like, Google, what can I look up? What other words mean coach? And I was like, oh, the mentorships that I've been doing for the Oregon State Bar, the Bar Association, all these things. I'm like, I can just call myself a mentor and people will understand what that means. And it resonates better with me actually. So I started calling myself a mentor, but I still was nervous about telling the other lawyers about this because when they found out that I did a yoga teacher training, the first question was, so you're not practicing law anymore? I'm like, no, I'm doing both. They're like, I don't know about that, Michelle. I'm like, yes, I'm doing both and you're not my boss and this is what's happening. 
And I said, you can do more than just practice a lot too, if you want, like, it's fine to do what you want, but don't go judging me for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so because of that reaction and the assumption yeah. that you could only be one thing in life, I decided to test the mentorship program with non-lawyers. Mm -hmm. And all of my friends in other professions were like, what about me? My vet was like, we need help too. We have a high level of burnout and no one's here to help us. My doctor even was like, what about us in primary care? We're constantly seeing patients. And I hadn't thought about all of those people. So I actually ended up calling a business balance professional because I realized that even though I have my personal unique experience with practicing law with a high, high caseload, 100 plus clients at a time when I was a public defender, the same kind of concepts apply to other professions. And I could help them too with my super analytical brain and then my yoga cart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And you've answered my next question, which were, what, what are some of the challenges that you discovered along the way? <laughs> Excuse me. And one of which was, I heard you say, that people thought you either had to do one or the other, right? That, which is coming from their belief, right? And it's probably why they don't, um, you know, they don't seek out anything else to to combat, you know, getting rid of that stress and relieving that stress. It's interesting because I think that especially as Americans, we tend to wear the word busy or we tend to wear the word, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm so important. I've got so much stuff to do. I'm incredibly busy as a badge. Right. We are we don't take as much vacation as the rest of the world. And I think we're just now seeing the value of what you're bringing into the world, which is we need to have that outlet somewhere and we need it to be a healthy outlet. Right. Instead of spending the money or going to the bars or doing whatever to have that healthy outlet for that really high, um, that really high level of workload, whether like you said, you're a vet or you're, you're a medical doctor or you're an attorney. So I love that you're providing people with that idea that they can be balanced, that it doesn't have to be go, 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 and then burnout. There's, there's preventative medicine there, right, that you can do in terms of yoga. So what are the things besides the yoga do you help people with to get them into balance? So one of the big things is just, it doesn't necessarily have to be yoga. It's moving our bodies. I actually learned this part. I've always been active. I did all the sports growing up. Any sports that the girls were allowed to do, I was doing, or even when we weren't supposed to be boys versus girls was that, that happened on the playground at my school. And so I've always needed physical activity. And uh, I don't know if I, what I did in my prior life to cause this, but I actually had another accident, another head mm. injury, a really minor one, but I was car doored. I ride my bike most places here in Portland. It's usually really safe. Um, but one day I was riding my bike, someone popped their car door open. I had no time to think, dodge it. I just held on for a dear life and my bike actually launched and I was, sky born for quite a while and slowly uh, I started landing but I noticed it and the fact that I had done all the yoga and I also used to be a public defender came in really handy because my brain was like oh man this is bad bad stuff seeing upside down seeing all these houses go by and I was like what can I do because that's my person like what can I do and so I thought about, I'm like well I can control my breath I can't control the movement and all the drunk people seems to survive the accidents. And I'm like, because they're unconscious, half unconscious. So I thought, how can I get there? And I shut my eyes and I just started breathing. Eventually I hit, I had a helmet on or I wouldn't be here today. Slid across the road for a while longer. But I ended up with a lot of injuries from that, as you can imagine. No broken bones, much to the amazement of the medical staff who constantly asked me, how did you do that? So I've told this story a couple of times. They're like, whoa, maybe I should try yoga. Like, or just try to figure out some mindfulness so that you can go internally to help keep yourself safe when you're not otherwise safe. So during that time, though, I couldn't sit for more than 20 to 30 minutes or I'd get stuck in a seated position and it was really hard to get up. So I started a timer where I would get up every 25 minutes and I would move my body because I had to. And then I started realizing that it's really helpful to move your body regularly uh, Heather and I sometimes are on calls together and I frequently will just put my video off because I'm like, I'm moving around doing some weird motions. It'll look odd on the video, but it's keeping me happy because we don't always have time to do like a 90 minute yoga practice or go for a run when it's pouring outside 
or like right now, my normal schedule, I'm like I said, normally I'm pretty active and do something every day, but due to COVID, I can't go to the Pilates studio and use my favorite machine there. I can't go to the gym and run. I can't do the wait list. I have a little bit in back behind the screen, my elliptical and some weights at home, but it's not the same. And I'm trying to learn how to do what I can. But some days what I can do is just get up every 25 minutes, move. Mm -hmm. It happens to coincide very well. As a lawyer, we're tied to the billable hour quite a bit. And so I can hit stop and 25 minutes rounds up to be 30 minutes. So I don't feel like I'm wasting a whole bunch of time. And then I just come back on so like just a five minute break or go and get tea. I, I get a bunch of stuff done in that short time to just reset slightly. It is hard though to do it because you might be in flow mode with work. And sometimes, yeah, I'm like snooze on that alarm. I intentionally keep it on the other side of the room like it's an alarm for the morning. So that's my big thing is actually just moving and getting up from the desk so that we don't become very oddly shaped human beings with the slumped shoulders and the really tight hips so you walk with your tail tucked underneath. The other is just carving out time, even if it's just that little four, or five minutes after 25 minute breaks to do something fun. I have this new dog, so we're playing together quite a bit. We're running around the backyard because he has kennel cough right now and he can't go play with the other dogs or interact with them like he wants to. So I'm running around with him in the backyard and throwing the ball and it's silly and goofy. We don't have a huge yard, so it's really challenging for both of us to have mm -hmm. fun with it. But to have that time to play and just not do or not be in mode all the time, because that's my tendency is to do, 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 go, go, go. And the other part I frequently do if I have the time is actually formal practices like yoga nidra, meditation. Mm -hmm. I teach restorative and yin yoga. And those are both really easy, great ways to get into mode. And one of my dreams is to actually in the next year or so to launch my online studio. It's been something that I've been wanting to do for the last six months. And a lot of my students are like, when are you going to get it done? But there's been a lot of challenges this year and I didn't want to add to my plate. I wanted to stay balanced like we talked about. Mm -hmm. And I know I have that tendency to just put more and more and more and more on until pigeon fever occurs. <laughs> I love that. I love that visual. I'm going to use that pigeon fever. So I love that you talked about when you were going through that accident and it, it's interesting when you do have an accident, you're, it, it, time stands still, right? So it's interesting that you had that much time to think about, okay, what can I control? Because I think that one of the things that's been really successful for me is to let go of the outcome, right? And you are a, a person with a finite amount of energy in this world. And to take that energy and not spin it and not waste it on things that you can't control, right? Like politics and the economy and all this other stuff. And work on what you can control and let go of the rest. So I love the idea of I the only thing I can control, I can't control the fact that I'm flying through the air, but I know I can control going within and closing my eyes and breathing and just running with it. So I love the idea that to to take that into, you know, that you, you talked about the mindfulness, because when you are a, a medical doctor or a veterinarian or a lawyer, you don't always have control over what your day looks like. Right. And so figure out what you can control and let go of the rest just to go with it, to kind of go within and just kind of roll with the punches like you did when you landed, obviously. So I love that you talk about just having that five minutes of mindfulness, because I think for a lot of people, they figure I don't have an hour for this. I don't have, you know, they're thinking I don't have, you know, 15 minutes, let alone an hour. But you're saying that it just takes five minutes just to have that mindfulness or to even have fun which is something that I think as adults, we lose sight of, right? We're not allowed to have fun. We're, that's I'm at work, I'm not supposed to be doing that. But I think that's what's gonna keep people balanced. So I'm really glad that you brought that point up as well. Oh yeah, that's what I just, I've really noticed it for myself, like I said, and I've noticed practicing. I mean, even practicing as an attorney, a uh, little short story, we don't have a lot of control over what's happening once we're in that courtroom, especially the judge is in charge. Sometimes our clients do things we don't expect to have happen or the other side or our witnesses. There's always something that's a surprise and you have to roll with it. And one thing that happened to me, gosh, I think I was a year in maybe as a public defender, 
a baby public defender, there was a very uh, challenging, I'll just put it, judge who uh, was known to be difficult. We usually got along. Everyone was rather surprised I got along with this human being because the person was difficult. But one day I said the wrong thing in that person's mind and they just went after me. It was like, are you really a, a lawyer? Did you actually pass the bar? Just attack mode. And my poor client is like sitting right next to me, scared to death because this person has all the power and I'm getting yelled at and being questioned. So I just went to the breath work. Like I said, I, luckily I started doing yoga at the same time I started working as a public defender. So I just did the breath work and that worked only this much, not fully. And then I started spelling the word affidavit because if a judge, you believed them to be prejudiced against you, you can file an affidavit of prejudice and you never have to appear in front of them again. So I just kept on spelling the word and breathing while I got just hammered by this judge. Mm -hmm. Eventually the judge stopped talking and looked at me and like, don't you have anything to say? I'm like, your honor, I feel like this might not be a good time. And my client is really, really scared right now that you're going to penalize him for your anger at me. And since you don't think I'm actually a lawyer, I think the best course of action is for us to set this over and for some other attorney from my office to come. And that's what we did. I actually was really relieved in some ways that I never had to deal with that judge again. But a week later, probably because of my response, the judge felt bad. And so I started hearing from various clerks that the judge wanted to see me. And I was like, I don't wanna see the judge. I'm pretty happy with our current situation. And our office talked about it and we decided, okay, be a grown up, go see what the judge has to say. The judge bought me a plant and we had a conversation that was like this, Michelle, I don't understand what happened. I'm like, well, you lost your temper with me and accused me of a lot of things. I said, I don't know why you did that. We just went back and forth a little bit. And the judge said, well, I know I have a tendency to fly off the handle. What can I do? And I'm just sitting there thinking, you're asking me what you can do. Okay. And so I just, we ended up with the most bizarre, she said, I need something. There's a woman. She said, I need a gesture. I'm like, I will pull on my ear when you're doing something outlandish. And that became the gesture that she was happy about. So I leave the courtroom with a plant in my hands. I'm wandering through the courthouse because of course the judge is on the top floor and I'm walking through the building. Everyone's like, what is this? I'm like, judge blah, 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 just gave me a plant as an apology. And everyone was just dumbfounded that one, I was getting a plant from a judge, two, the, the judge actually apologized for their behavior. It was pretty wild to just see like, but the point is I stayed calm is what happened. Because my, what I wanted to do, the other part of me, the very feisty part, I wanted to just lay in right back and say, hey, wait a minute, and just say all the things. But I was like, that's not going to help the situation. You know, what's going to help the situation and what's not about, it's not about my ego, it's about what can I do for my client and how can I stop this in a calm way so we can all get out of here alive. <laughs> and I don't mean like my client could have been sentenced to death. I just yeah. feel that way. But my client could have gone to jail is what could have happened. The judge could have really taken it out on him and made him go into jail because he violated his supervision. But it didn't work out that way because I stayed calm. That is that is such an impressive story on so many levels because you you led by example, right? And you, because I'm sure that that judge was used to people fighting back or engaging, right? Which is why she said, well, what do you have to say about that, right? Don't you have anything to say? Because I'm sure most people did have something to say back. But I love that you exhibited your power of choice. Like it doesn't matter what's going on out there in the outside world with this judge and her temper, but I have a choice as to how I react to that, right? And and I love that you were that you were able to lead by example and show her that she has a choice as well, that she can control her temper. And I love the little, you know, the ear pull <clears throat> to let her know that she was getting, you know, a little bit out of control. So I what an amazing story, because you don't ever think that, you know, you think that a judge is unapproachable and, and not, you know, that they have the last word and what they say goes. So I, I love that this is also a great analogy for you to have, you know, to allow people 
in your profession, in the balanced professional business, to let them know that they do have a choice as to how they handle things, right? They can either, you know, engage even more or they could take a time out and say, okay, listen, I have a choice here. I didn't have to be berated or belittled or, or whatever, yelled at. I can, I can, you know, give everybody the whole courtroom a time out and we can, we can reconvene when we're all a little bit, you know, acting like, like a doll. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what I wanted to point out, of course. And you're right. I think most people usually responded with equal fire or yeah. just disdain instead yeah. of compassion. I mean, yeah. I wasn't very feeling compassion. I was just more worried about my client than anything else. Of course. And yeah. Yes. But it was really wild. Like we ended up having a decent relationship from then on. And not that we're close friends by any means, but it was nice energetically to not have someone as the enemy. Like mm -hmm. every time, I mean, everybody knew what happened because the courtroom's like a high school sure. gossip central. And it was it was nice. And so I do credit both yoga for that ability to pause and stop the mind, monkey mind. But also looking back, I was a camp counselor when I was younger until my dad pulled the plug on my not so prosperous career as a camp <laughs> counselor making $800 a summer. Um, but we had to deal with things all the time with the kids and get them to calm down. And if one kid started going, everybody else would too. So looking back, probably all those times literally dealing with children helped me deal with childish behavior in adults. Yep, exactly. Well, and you mentioned that you're, you wanted to do an online yoga, which is, I was going to ask you, which, what, what, what's your next passion project? Where do you see your company and your practice evolving into? We actually have three main branches of it, and it's all under the balanced professional. One is that yoga, online yoga studio that's mm -hmm. tabled for now. I have lots of ideas and whatnot, and I teach yoga every week anyway to my students here in the Portland area, not live not in person, but via Zoom, the weird Zoom yoga classes. So that's something that's a tabled passion project. But right now I'm working on the Thrive Formula, which is about helping people get their mind, body together so that they can get all the work done and be there every day instead of winding up with that pigeon fever, like work, 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 work boom, pigeon fever sets in and you actually can't get anything done. And then you're further behind than when you started. Or if you're self-employed, you're sick and trying to figure out how to manage everything if you don't have support staff, which a lot of people when they start their own business don't have that support. But part of it I realized, and with some help from a coach, is that it's all, in order to create all this space, you have to have the right systems. Because mm -hmm. I can say, oh, you need to have these rests. You should think about savoring stillness or play and all these things. And a lot of people are going to go, I don't have time for that. Or as I used to speak regularly at the Oregon Women Lawyers Conference, uh, retreat is what it was called. And more than once, an attorney would come up to me afterward and say, it's easy for you to say that, Michelle. And I'm like, why is that? And they're like, well, you're not practicing anymore. And I'm like, wait a minute. I am practicing. I'd like you to tell my clients that I'm not an active member of the Oregon State Bar and all the judges with deadlines. And every time they'd be like, oh, wait, whoa, you're both practicing and doing these things. Because I think what's happened, and at least with the lawyers here in Oregon, is that we have, a, I'm going to call it a free service. We pay for it because we have mandatory professional liability fees that are rather spendy. But we pay for that. And part of what funds this other organization that provides free services. So we've got the professional liability fund paying the money to every year you have to pay, what, $4,000 or something. And then in return, not only do we have liability coverage for malpractice, but also they have this service, which is prevention, basically. The Oregon, what is it called? Oregon Attorney Assistance Project. And it's free, but none of them are practicing attorneys. So they've all been attorneys, but they're not currently practicing. Mm -hmm. And what that ends up happening is that I think the lawyers are hearing from people who are not practicing and they're thinking, yada, 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 yada. You say all these things, but you don't know what it's really like, or you haven't practiced in a long time. Lawyers are very um, lone wolves and very uh, opinionated. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. We definitely do 
in order to do the job, we have to believe we know what we're doing. And we believe that even when we don't know what we're doing sometimes, which can be a little bit of a problem. <laughs> so what I've noticed though, is that, yeah, telling people that I'm actually practicing and providing the mentorship at the same time for lawyers, especially has been really helpful. Eventually I'm gonna switch gears and mainly be doing the mentorship and practice a little bit, but I still love both. Well, and I love that you brought up the idea of systems because I think that especially in a professional world, they, um, you know, what I've discovered in Portland is that uh, we have a lot of woo here, which is what I, you know, one of the things that I always talk about is my particular system is where the woo meets the work, right? Because I think you have to have both because you can have the, the yoga and the mindful and the meditation and that, but then you have to have a system behind that. So I love that you talked about having a system behind that because that's where the woo meets the work, right? Without one side of that coin, the other side of the coin doesn't exist. So I really appreciate you you know, talking about that. So you had mentioned it was a three-prong approach. So it was the yoga and then the thrive formula. And then the third was the biz, the one that's more geared toward business that I keep on changing the name of because I had a name I loved. And then being an attorney, I Googled it and looked on the copy mark trademark websites for the government and realized that someone had written a book with that and it was trademark and copyright. And yes, it's not good. Michelle Ryan is not writing a book called that. But I wanted <laughs> to call it the, what it, I can't even remember. I Yesterday, I tried really hard to delete it from my brain. Like, stop think, calling it that. Uh stop calling it that. <laughs> And I totally am now spacing on what it's called. I have it written down somewhere, or maybe I the sent it to formula? you. Heather. Was it the freedom formula? The freedom formula is what I wanted to call it, but okay. I found out that that didn't. That's that, what's called freedom formula. Is the book? Oh, that's right. I was going to call it either. I actually have a poll on my page somewhere. Either the business freedom code or the twenty-hour work week formula. Oh trying to decide between the two. If anyone has strong ideas, let me know. <laughs> or maybe like freedom framework or something. So I love the, the, the 20 hour work week. What does that look like? Well, that's, that's something that came to me yesterday afternoon. I was brainstorming like, hmm, what can I call this thing since I can't call it what I want to? Like, okay, there's a reason it's not gonna work. I'm not just gonna call it that. This is not working. And then I started thinking about what is it actually about? What is the end result? And it's what I've been doing since I've been in private practice for the last 17 years, is I have a 20 hour work week. Most of my friends have 40 to 80 hour work weeks. And it's really nice. It enables me to do all those things. Like I said, normal times, go ride my bike to the Pilates studio and be gone for two hours in the middle of the day mm -hmm. to take my dog on the walks when it's dry out rather than pouring down rain all these little things each day, but also the bigger things and go on vacations and things too. So I was like, this is actually what the goal is. And it's really nice when you can create work so that it works out that way. Part of it is obviously controlling the number of clients you have and your rates so that it you make enough money for your needs and your success. And the other part is just coming up with strategies and systems to make it work. And a lot of it is boundary setting. I'm huge on boundaries. That's I don't want to build a wall. But yeah, boundaries are my friend. My clients, I mean, my clients nowadays, I, I work as a public defender still, but I largely represent people who are incarcerated and in prison, either federal or state prisons throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And those clients, I'm one of the only people they can call for free. So mm -hmm. if they could, if I let them, they would call me all the time. And I have good relationships with my clients. So they also sometimes start thinking me as a friend too. And that's part of the boundary setting. But I've explained to them when I'm actually available. Like, okay, I might be answering the phone other times, but the best time to reach me is between this time and this time on this day. And some of them initially balk at it. Like, what? I should be able to reach you anytime. I said, like, nope, I can't reach you any time of the day and you can't reach me. I have this time set up and I explain it to them because I noticed if you don't explain to people why you have these things, they bristle. Like, why? Well, who do you think you are? Well, the public defender's office has this twice a week. And I'm like, well, great for them was my initial <laughs> response internally. But I was like, okay, I need to explain to them. And what I explained to my clients, look, because 
I have these two, well, it's actually a three hour window each week for you. That means I can't get anything substantive done on your case. And okay. all the other times that I'm not available, I'm actually doing work to promote your case. I have systems, we have all these systems in place with the weird ways you can communicate with people in prison, how to set up a call, we can set up a confidential call. Nowadays, we can't do visits because of COVID, but I have systems in place. Half my clients are more mentally ill. And if my mentally ill clients who are in prison can figure this out, anyone can handle these boundaries. <laughs> but I do think it's explaining that to them because so much of the time people are just told, okay, this is this, this is that. I mean, even our doctor's offices do that to a degree. They tell you to come in 15 minutes before the appointment, and then you just sit there in the waiting room for an hour sometimes. I find that <laughs> annoying and a waste of my time. I'm back to my public defender mode when I go to the doctors anymore. <laughs> I take work with me and reading materials because that's what I used to do as a public defender. I figured out ways to optimize the amount of time I had available so that I didn't work quite as much. Didn't mean I wasn't working on weekends, but that was the life of the PD. Well, and I love that you talk about, you know, going back to the 20 hour work week, that you set it up that way. That goes back to that power of choice that you have, that everyone has, that I don't think we tap into enough. Like you said, that, you know, somebody tells us something and we just take that as status quo. Okay. Okay, you told me to be here at a certain time. I have to be here at a certain time. I'm not going to question why that has to happen. I'm just going to do it. So I love that you're bringing that out. And again, leading by example, because when you teach people that you have boundaries, what you're also teaching them is that it's okay for them to have boundaries as well. Right? Good point. I love that. Well, I'm trying to do that with my son. So who's 12 <laughs> and I'm teaching him, you know, mom has boundaries and you're allowed to have them as well. So, and he certainly does now. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Uh-huh. So what, looking back, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received, whether that was personal or business or. Hmm. It might just be to pause and breathe. Mm. Something mm -hmm. every yoga teacher says at some point or another, because it helped. It's helped me in so many ways, like the one I described, but also just other times where I can feel myself about to spin out or spinning out and pausing and getting my breath. And right now we have this new dog in the house and he's starting to, he's been here for more than a week. So he's starting to challenge ideas. And I'm like, sometimes it's a little challenging. He did, He's from a farm ranch in Texas. So he never walked on a leash, it seems like before. So we're walking and he gets scared sometimes. And I get scared and I'm like, well, pause and breathe, just that pause and breathe. It's simple little mantra. I don't know who said it. Like I said, it's probably one of my many yoga teachers over the years, but it's helped me in so many ways, like in the courtroom and outside in real life. And sometimes even, you know, interpersonal. My dad uh, was so funny. He was so disappointed after my first year practicing law or so. He's like, you're no fun to argue with anymore. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're like all calm and rational. You're not like passionate and saying things like you usually would. I'm like, hmm. well, it's probably a little bit of practicing law. Like I can't just say what I want as attorney. Someone might not be happy with me if I did whatever I wanted all the time. But I said, it's probably the yoga more than the law. They just came in at the same time. But it was so funny to hear that he missed the feistiness and the yeah. emotional like reaction mode that that's who I was when I was younger I was extremely reactive but thankfully that yoga came in to allow me to be more responsive instead that pause and breathe <laughs> well and I like that you could take that anywhere right that's not something that has to be you don't have to set it up you don't have to have any special equipment you have that with you wherever and it can help you through any situation right whether you're dealing with a client or a dog or you know, traffic or someone's opinion that's not jiving with yours or a doctor's visit or, you know, whatever, you can take it with you. I love that. Great advice. Yeah, I once had a yoga teacher that I'll always remember, she'll say, she used to say, take your shoulders out of your ears. And at the first class we were like, what is that supposed to mean? Because we all walk around like this way. If you could take your shoulders out of your ears, ha, ah, it just, your whole body. And that's, it's interesting how many people and how many of us walk around holding our breath all the time. Right. So I love that you oh, said yeah. that. I love that you said that. So what is something that like a habit of yours that you think has been instrumental in your success? 
be the bookmarking my day. And by that, I've done different versions of it throughout the years. When I was a public defender, at one point I worked downtown for a couple of years, and then I worked actually out in Washington County, which is about, depending on traffic, a half hour to an hour drive. And when I worked there, my bookmark, I didn't do this intentionally, it just was what happened. I just put in my, I couldn't do anything about the commute. It was what it was. Couldn't do anything about the other drivers. I was like, okay, what can I do with this time? This is before, this was back in the 90s, so before all the cell phones and things you could do in your car. And I would just put in my favorite tapes and sing along. And it made me happy going into work and it made me happy and let go of things so that when I came home from work, I wasn't just blah, 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 blah. This is all the shit that happened today. And this is how this is wrong and that's wrong because there's always injustices happening. It's the justice system. It's a system for a reason that's not quite just yet and far from it most of the time. But nowadays I do it a little bit more structured because I work from home. So mm -hmm. what I try to do is have some sort of start the day, well, I should start. I actually have it start with the closing of the day ritual on good days. My ritual includes clearing off my desk and putting things mm -hmm. away or getting things out for the next morning so that I'm prepared. Part of the ritual is also to set alarms for the next day because especially during COVID, I've noticed I've had a hard time noticing the different hours of a day. <laughs> so if I know that I have a phone call and I need to be dressed, and not just wearing my yoga clothes all day long, I set alarms the night before so that even if I forget something the next morning, those alarms are gonna go off and I'm gonna go, wait, why is my phone going off? Mm -hmm. So ideally the next morning, I know what I'm supposed to be doing because I did that the night before. But if somehow I, one part of the system gets, I have lots of checks and balances basically. <laughs> so the morning is that ideally I know what I'm doing as soon as I sit down at the desk. So I'm not just like, hey, let's look at Facebook and get down the rabbit hole or just start to do busy tasks like the cleaning up of my office. I realized I'm a morning person. Uh, my parents could have told everybody that long ago. I was I'm the only morning person in my family. So I grew up trying not to be a morning person. <laughs> But as a morning person, I have a lot of energy in the morning. And so I can get a lot done. And I'm very analytical in the morning. The mm -hmm. afternoon, not quite as much so until late afternoon. So mm -hmm. I figured out a way to structure my day so that that works. But if I spend the morning clearing off my desk, that's not the best use of that energy and analytical brain that is fully on. I can do that at the end of the day when I'm a little sleepy and want to take a nap instead. Yeah, I love that. I've also heard that too, that if you are walking into your office in the morning and thinking, what do I need to be doing today? It's too late to plan your day. Like you've, your your day needs to be planned the night before. So when you walk into your office, your mind immediately knows I need to do A, B, and C, as opposed to, oh, like you said, right? We get online, we think, man, yeah, maybe I'll just post a Facebook video or something. And then six hours later, we're still watching kitten videos on YouTube. <laughs> I know. Our, this is how our mind works. Well, you know, I'll go online and see how somebody else is doing it. And then you get sucked into that vortex of, of nothingness and then your day's gone. And, you know, so I love the idea of, of setting your intention the night before and then realizing what your, where your strengths are in terms of, you know, that you're, you're most analytical in the morning and you're most productive in the morning. So that's when you do all that work. And then you still know that you need to do stuff like set your desk up for the next day. So you do that when you don't really need that much, you know, mindfulness about it. It's just kind of autopilot work. So I love that, that you're working with your strengths and not against your strengths, not trying to change who you are, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a huge geek and read all the time. I'm a speed reader. My sister used to accuse me of not actually reading the books. I just mm -hmm. read way faster than most humans. I probably mm -hmm. skip words or I skip stories sometimes in paragraphs like, okay, they're telling a story about when they were little, whatever. Let's move on to the juicy information stuff. <laughs> but as a result, I started reading books. My dad actually had a book. I don't know which, it was Stephen Covey or one of those mm -hmm. old school gurus of productivity. But I started doing it once I was out on my own, like trying to optimize the amount of time. Like, okay, how can I get all this done and still have this? Because I refuse to only be able to be a public defender and not have anything else in my life. I was like, that's mm -hmm. not acceptable. So I, I was, I'm always reading. I usually have a lot of books out of the library <laughs> and own a lot mm -hmm. of books. And one of the books uh, started talking about circadian rhythms. And 
I'm like, oh, this is why I wake up early. This is what works best for me. And I just started using that concept of the circadian rhythm. Some of the advice of the book did not resonate with me with mm -hmm. when they think we should be doing things. But I was like, okay, when, yeah, it's like a seasonality, like, okay, it's winter time now. Mm -hmm. It's natural that I'm going to be tired at four o'clock when it's starting mm -hmm. to get dark outside because I very much function according to the sun. What can mm -hmm. I do if I have to be up at 4 p.m. and be awake and alert? What can I do myself? But also, how can I avoid having to be in that state that doesn't match what energetically I am? Mm -hmm. And so for my law practice, like I figured out in the morning, I get a lot of really nitty gritty, like very analytical and analyzing and lots of screens open and whatnot. Mm -hmm. By the afternoon, I'm not quite that on. I have phone calls and talk to people or I intentionally uh, will read transcripts. Part of my exciting job as a public trainer is reading thousands of pages of transcripts sometimes. <laughs> but it's easy because it's it's clear, it's simple. You read, you think, you take notes. It's mm -hmm. not requiring a lot of extra. I don't have to produce anything new. Mm -hmm. When I have to produce new things, I need to be in that morning brain that's much more activated. When I was younger, I did not understand this at all. I largely relied on caffeine and sugar to get me through all of these times. Mm -hmm. I used to actually go and uh, buy those giant size bags of M&Ms at Costco. Uh -huh. And that was in literally in my drawer at the desk. So that when I hit that low and I'm like, I still need to get this done. It's due at the end of the day. I would just start eating M&Ms for the mm -hmm. caffeine and sugar, not healthy mm -hmm. whatsoever, did not help with my blood sugar levels or my energy the next day. And so I finally was like, okay, let's get a handle on it and be an adult and <laughs> eat healthier. I have lots of ways I'm eating healthier than I did as a kid. And I say kid, partly the brain that I had when I was 25, 26, mm -hmm. 35 even, was still that go, 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 fuel it up with sugar and caffeine and it it was functional and it was workable but at some point my body started saying mm, no this is not yeah. working michelle and yep. i was not happy about it and i had to think okay what is happening what's not happening i am getting older i don't have <laughs> infinite energy anymore i'd like to continue to grow old like my grandmother did and be cleaning out my gutters at age 89. so wow. how can i do that yeah. Yeah. Well, and I love that you talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, always being reading, always being into, you know, having a book open and reading books, because my next question is to talk about like, what is feeding your brain right now? Are there podcasts that you're listening to or websites that you like to tap into every day or books that are open on your bookshelf and or on your nightside stand that you're kind of, you know, using to, to, to feed your brain a little bit. See. I wasn't kidding when I said I have a lot of books out from the library. I'm usually reading five books at once. How many? Uh, yeah, I. There are different topics. Some of them are uh, like right now. I'm rereading my one of my yoga teachers, Bernie Clark's book, Yin Yoga, and he had a newer edition come out. It's very similar to the old one, but I'm rereading it because Yin Yoga is all about. Chinese medicine and their five elements and winter is a different element than fall. So I'm always like, okay, let me look at this winter with different eyes. Like, okay, this is the water element. How does the water element apply in this 2020 COVID time? And it's about going internal. And so that sometimes fuels what other books I get out of the library because I personally have a huge problem whenever we have the time change. It throws yeah, yeah. me off so much. So I also am usually reading some book about sleep and how to make sleep as best as possible. And uh, yeah, I am reading lots of fun fiction books, nonfiction books. I probably have 50 books out of the library at any given moment. Did I lose you, Heather? I don't see you anymore. Hmm. I've lost Heather. Let me pause. There you are. You're coming really back. I don't know what I did. I just, I was, yeah, just boop, gone. I love technology. Yeah. You never know. It's kind of like life. You never know what's going to happen. 
<laughs> exactly. I'm sorry. You were talking about books that you have open on your nightstand and you were talking about the five elements and how this whole time, you know, changing time has, has always throws you off. Yeah. So I'm reading my friend, my friend and teacher, Bernie Clark's Yin Yoga book again, reading portions of it, I should say, just focusing again on the winter element and how to mm -hmm. optimize things. And there's also a book I got out of the library. I was trying to find it on my desk, Managing Your Emotional Health Using Traditional Chinese Medicine. But this one gets really a little uh, deeper than I personally go into, but about herbs, natural foods, acupuncture. I look at it as what things can I do to fuel myself up? Because this time of year is a little bit depleting. I like the sun. I like being outside. When it's raining all the time, it's hard to be outside. So what can I do? Yes, in the morning, I can use a, one of those uh, lights, full spectrum lights. Mm -hmm. That helps certainly if it's dark and dreary, which is why I also have books about sleep on my nightstand to make sure I'm sleeping the hours I need to sleep because I know if I don't get my seven to nine hours, I'm pretty grumpy mm -hmm. and unproductive the next day. But I'm also reading like just fun books. I, for some reason recently, the last two years, I've been reading books set during wartime in various countries and about women who have overcome whatever is going on with the situation. It's just interesting perspectives and seeing mm -hmm. another reality and totally pulling me out of my reality because no matter how bad things are at any given moment, our country is not at war. I have food and I have toilet paper too. And all <laughs> the things. It's all about perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. They're always good perspectives. I just finished a book called The Wangs Versus the Universe that a friend of mine had recommended. It's pretty goofy and silly. It's kind of like this. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Schitt's Creek, except it's an Asian family who loses everything. So now that I've binge watched Schitt's Creek, there is no one of those left. So I was happy that The Wangs Versus the Universe easy read, entertaining, just like Schitt's Creek. Some of the characters, you're like, hmm but then you start loving them all. And it's an interesting, it's also a little bit different culture, which I like to delve mm -hmm. into because it's most things are so easily set in the white culture nowadays. And mm -hmm. both because of who I am and I always have been, but also because of the work I do, I'm very much about uh, paying attention and trying to actively educate myself about cultural issues, about race issues, because there's always more to learn. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that. And I, you know, it's funny, I was talking to my son one day, and he was, you know, he was probably in fourth grade at that time. And he said, I can hardly wait till I'm out of school, because then I won't have to learn anymore. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> school, ne school's never out, like you're always learning. And, and so I love that your attitude is that, you know, just to stay curious about other things. And we do fall into that trap so much, and that we continue to read books that you know, go along with our intros. But I think it's fun every once in a while to read a book that you like normally would never pick up. You started saying off in the very beginning, how many books do you have out checked out of the library at any given time? Well, normally I might, the library lets you have up to 50 books on Kindle and audiobooks, And I actually am close to it right now because of the diversity of books. Wow. One of the things I, yeah, my husband is just like, Right now, I think the library just sent me a notice that they're open again, but they closed. So like, I sometimes have like three cookbooks out from the library, a book about Chinese medicine, some books just for fun reading. And if, especially now during COVID, I've been really happy that I ended up with a smorgasbord of books. I do admit that a little part of each day, normal times, is managing my library loans to make sure I know which books are due and not due. But it's also part of my normal habit is to go to the library and I stumble upon a new book and I'm like, oh, well, that book's interesting. I'm looking over here because I saw one of the books that I had out. I was like, oh, I didn't even realize that was on my desk because I didn't clean it up last night. <laughs> it got buried <laughs> underneath the piles. But yeah, I have, I love the library because I do speed read and I think it's possible. I'm not sure. I technically have a hundred books out right now between the audio and paper books. There's a bunch that just need to be returned because the library has been closed for the last couple of weeks. And I'm like, okay, where do I put them? I just, I cleared a <laughs> shelf on my uh, bookshelf at home just for library books. So I know where they all are. You're, you're an inspiration. I have like three books. So my thing is I collect books, right? 
And I like to think that I'm going to absorb the information through osmosis just by basically having them on my bookshelf. So you're a great reminder that I actually need to open up the books to read them. I have like usually two to three books that I'm, you know, I, I very rarely open a book, read it through and finish it and put it back and get a new one. I've got like three or four open at the same time. So thank you for justifying my habit in making me feel that that's okay. <laughs> I totally do that because it's rare for me to go through the book and just one book at a time. The other part I realized the same thing you were just saying though, is that sometimes I'll buy a book because I, I really liked it and I had to return it to the library. And then mm -hmm. sometimes I don't finish it and yeah. it's, there's no deadline. And it's weird that the library mm -hmm. is my deadline to finish some of the books. Some of the books I just read slowly and it takes a long time because I like some of the books. I like to have those ideas just, filter through, or like I was talking about the Chinese medicine, I'm less likely to want to hear about the fire element in summer right now because we are right. not in summer. I want yeah. to hear about how to add more of the fire element to my life right now, mm -hmm. but there's some books that seasonality, I guess that's the yeah. word, seasonality, the whole thing of nature and rhythm and where I am. This time of year, I probably read a little bit more than normal, yeah. especially, you know, no travel, can't go anywhere. Right. Yeah, but I can go somewhere with my book in my mind, just like they told us when we were little kids in elementary school. Yes. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it'll be interesting to hear how much, you know, the sales of books and, and Kindle and books um, on, you know, on audio and, and all those kinds of things have gone up since COVID has arrived. So which might be a silver lining in all of this, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully it'll keep pals alive. Exactly, exactly. So I wanted to let people know how to work with you and to, if you had anything to share with the audience, we can pop that into the comments. And how do people find you and how do they work with you? Um, let's see, this simplest way is to go to balancedprofessional.com. My website has all sorts of things there. Another easy way, I always forget the URL, thrivesociety.life. Um, which leads to my Facebook group. You have to answer a couple of really simple questions like your name and email to join. Things you know the answers to. But on the Thrive Life Society Life, that Facebook group, which is private, um, we have videos. And I'm working on getting my productivity challenge up and uploaded. We did it a, a year or two ago and it was really popular. So I'm working on uploading those videos because I know. New Year's resolution time is coming up for lots of people who do that. And productivity is a simple aspect of it. And it also has videos about releasing, like we were talking about the shoulders. Mm -hmm. I'm actually a trained Franklin Method instructor. And Franklin Method is a movement technology. I call it technology because it's pretty amazing. It's not just movement. It's using mind, body, and using science-based research about neurocognitive issues. Uh, so it but there are things you can do at your desk. And one of them is about the shoulders and just how to release the neck and shoulders through visualization, motivation, all sorts of fun things. And I usually have, in good times, I have a new video once a month. Perfect. Recently, okay. I probably haven't uploaded quite as many. <laughs> so I've got, got my physical website up. I've got the perfect. So I've got balanceprofessional.com, thrivesociety.life, L-I-F-E. Yes. L-I-F-E. <clears throat> Perfect. So I was told... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, it's a... .com was taken. That's why I always have to look and remember it's not .com. <laughs> it's .life. .life. Okay. I didn't even know that was an option. That's awesome. Perfect. Yeah, well, I don't mind. I've done that. I will put that information in the show notes below this video. And is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience or anything else you'd like to, to chat about? The only thing I'd just like to remind everybody that it's okay to stop and pause and breathe. Even now during COVID, we all feel like we're doing a lot of pausing and breathing, but we're probably not. We're probably spinning out, watching the news too much, trying to decide, like my friend who notified me what her what her date was when she thought she would be vaccinated for COVID. I'm like, how much research did you do to try and figure that out? Like that attempt to control the uncontrollable and the unknown rather yeah. than just enjoying the now. So yeah, and knowing that it is the ultimate nature's time looking outside, there are not that many leaves on the trees. It's hibernation time and it's okay for us to hibernate too a little bit and rest so that when we all come out of this as the weather improves and 
because the vaccines are all coming out, we can enjoy our life and be rested and ready to go. Because if we're burning ourselves out right now, we're not going to have a lot of energy when we go from this very introverted yin time of year and life. This whole year has been very yin-like to go to a yang active mode. We're just not going to enjoy it quite as much. So that's my recommendation. We all just accept the pause, accept the breath. It doesn't mean stillness necessarily, but it could be just enjoying what it is rather than fighting against reality. I love that. I love that. And there's a lot of, there's still a lot of work that happens in the restorative stage, right? Because that's usually when you're like, when you sleep at night, that's when your body's doing all that repairing work, right? It's not, it's not in the phonetic energy of the day. It's, it's when your whole body is quiet. So I love that you, that you are reminding us that we don't have to physically be doing something all the time in order for something to be happening. And sometimes the best things happen when we just rest. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Now I need a nap. <laughs> and that's totally okay, too. <laughs> I think I'm going to go take one. The house is quiet. The dogs aren't playing. I think I'm going to go do that. So nice. I will put all your information down below. And I so appreciate you joining us today. This oh, is a good fun. And I can't wait to watch. And I can't wait to, to see the, the evolution of this. And, and to, to I'm going to go check out a couple of your videos online and see what that's all about. And I've never heard of the Franklin Technique. So I'm going to go check that out as well. Yep, and feel free to you know comment, message, go to the page, the group, or the Facebook page, whatever works. And if someone wants to directly email me, you can Michelle at balancedprofessional.com. Perfect. I will put that information down below as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And Thanks, I hope you have Heather. a fabulous, yeah, my pleasure. I hope you have a fabulous new year. You too. It's exciting. 2021s and a few days. I know, I know, which actually this year I'm really excited about. I'm really excited about it. I feel like I've been in a little chrysalis kind of, you know, doing my my repair work and my restoration and, and now I'm ready to bust out and make things happen. So I know I saw you have some exciting things that are being launched soon. I do. I do. I do. So good. Well, I will see you around in calls and I will see you around in your business. And I appreciate you being here with me today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Take care. Bye, guys.